<clears throat> Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. On behalf of URI Foundation and Alumni Engagement and the Women's Leadership Council, I'd like to welcome you uh, to our event today. I'm Mary Carnes, for those of you who don't know me, and I'm an Assistant Director in Alumni Engagement. I'm honored to be part of the Women in Leadership Speaker Series. This program showcases inspiring careers of highly successful and influential women and provides the opportunity to share their knowledge and experiences with students and alumni. I want to thank those of you who have participated in the past and have returned to us and also welcome you, welcoming those of you who are here for the first time. Before we begin, I would love to share a little bit with you about the Women's Leadership Council. The council is led by a group of volunteers and supports and enhances the personal and professional growth of URI women. And they do this by cultivating meaningful opportunities to unite, celebrate, empower, and learn from each other while forming connections and relationships. Additionally, the Women's Leadership Council promotes the Women Transforming Women Endowed Scholarship. The scholarship is awarded each year to a women-identified student who holds a leadership position and maintains a GPA of at least 3.0. Today's program will be a question and answer session, style session between our featured speaker, Tolani Olangande, and our host, Mary Beth Riley McGreen. While you're listening to the program, please feel free to write your questions in the Q&A if you would like to, and we'll spend some time at the end to answer some questions. As always, I'm very excited to introduce our host today, Mary Beth Riley McGreen. She is a content strategist and a writer for the University of Rhode Island. She has won seven case awards from the International Council for Advancement and Support of Education for excellence in writing. Most recently, she won a gold case award for a magazine profile of Dr. Anthony Fauci. She has written many, written about many of URI's accomplished alumni and faculty, including award-winning journalist Christiane Amanpour, Vlad Dutiers, Thomas Farragher, and a Tony Award winner, Andrew Burnap, as well as ocean explorer, Bob Ballard. So Mary Beth, once again, thank you for joining us today and helping to host our program. I'm not gonna turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Mary. Um, I am thrilled to talk to Professor Tolani Ola Gundai today, um, who is an expert in leadership. Um, and maybe we could start by talking about um, how you've come to um, your role at URI. Thank you, Mary Beth. I'm very excited to be here and to talk to you all about leadership and how I arrived here at URI. Um, I was a College of Pharmacy student. I graduated in 2017. And like any other college student, I had a thought about what do I really want to do with my degree as a pharmacist. Um, and so I took my first position at the Providence VA where I gained various experience teaching simulation and working in the pharmacy at that time. And from my um, exploration there, I one of my bosses gave me a list of different books. Um, and one of the books that stood out to me was uh, the book on emotional intelligence. And from my reading and my experience with emotional intelligence, I decided and I thought, I wonder if emotional intelligence might be linked to patient safety and um, uh, patient overall outcome in the hospitals. And so I started to kind of interview different professionals. I interviewed social workers, surgeons, pharmacists, um, and different uh, healthcare professionals, asking them about their experience in the hospital. And from there, I gathered um, different information and I was able to put together a presentation on how emotional intelligence could possibly be linked to patient safety and patient outcome. And um, my first talk was maybe um, 20 medical students, including pharmacy students and social worker. And so I was invited again for the second time and that in, the number increased to 50. And then I was in, invited again for the third time and the number increased to 200. Um, so I realized that people were really interested in the topic and whatever it is that I had to say about humanity um, and um, how we impact the healthcare field and our environment. And so how I arrived at my position actually um, was 
I received an email in my junk mail saying that there's a position in the College of Pharmacy. And if you would like to apply, it's a temporary position for a year. And so I applied, I was very excited. Unfortunately, I didn't get that position, but I got another email in my junk mail again, saying that um, there's a, sorry, you didn't get that position, go on the website, maybe you'll find something you're in interested in. And at that time, I've been working with the youth for the past eight years. I've uh, participated in various uh, community outreach, and I've been thinking about the topic of leadership and kind of gaining different experience there. And I realized I loved teaching. And so I went on the, I was actually going to delete the email, but I decided I'm just going to go on the website just to see what's there. And so I clicked on the, the link and I was scrolling through the URI website. And I saw a position that says teaching leadership working with the youth and doing community outreach through cooperative extension. And I thought, this is too good to be true. And so I clicked on it and I applied and um, long story short, I received the position and I'm very thankful that I enjoy working with 4-H youth and working with cooperative extension and working with undergrad and talking about the topics of leadership and how to become a leader in during global crisis um, that impacts the environment and impacts the healthcare field. Uh, so that's how I arrived at my position here. So um, in our prior conversation, you talked about having um, a moment when doing work at the VA, um, and I've, I found it fascinating. You talked about um, the moment that you realized that what you were teaching, that the, that the optimal audience for what you were teaching was actually young people. And could you just talk about that switch that you made because of what you observed at the VA? So while I was at the VA, I was very excited about my topic. And of course I was younger. So um, people saw me as you know the young person giving them uh, different ideas on how to improve patient safety. Um, and so, but I realized that during my conversation and asking for feedback on what people thought about what I was teaching them and explaining to them about um, how emotional intelligence might possibly impact um, patient safety and overall um, outcome in the hospital. Mm -hmm. They would say to me, Talani, those are all great ideas. Um, we love your topic on when you talk about self-awareness and when you talk about social awareness and when you talk about relationship management and how the people you work with end up being the family members that you may not necessarily um, want to have as family members, but they're just a part of your family because you get to work with them eight hours a day or even more. Um, and so um, they said, it's such a great idea. However, we are just so far gone in the way we process things at work and the way we process life. Um, uh, so we don't know how we can implement these changes in our lives today. And so I thought, oh, that's interesting. Um, but all the students I taught, they still had the capacity to make changes uh, mm -hmm. in their future. Um, so I had an epiphanic moment. Um, during that time at the VA, and I realized that I think if I'm if I want to make a difference in my generation, or I want to help my generation or the generation to come learn from the previous generation, because I think there's a reason why history repeats itself. It's because we're not discerning enough to pick up on what worked in the previous generation and what didn't work. So that way we don't replicate what didn't work or make the same mistake over and over again. Um, so I realized that I really want to impact the next generation. Um, and through my experience working with the youth and kind of listening to what their issues were and what they felt was wrong with the world and how they felt that the solution should come to be, I realized that that probably is my audience to kind of target um, that from the university level or the educational level. Um, and I felt that college is a great place where we kind of learn about who we are as people and we learn about what our purpose is in life and we learn about what's wrong with the world and how our purpose and who we are as people can help fix that problem. Um, so I wanted to be here at the university level, providing tools for different students um, during this generation um, or around this generation to help them make decisions about their future. So that way they don't end up 
um, as adults who are still confused about who they are as people and what their purpose and how they can make what is wrong with the world, uh, with the world right? Um, so that's kind of how I um, experienced that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've noticed that actually in, in helping, um, helping um, uh, students uh, with, their, with their college application essays. We asked them at 17 to assess their lives and to draw big lessons. And, I, and, I, and we don't do that again. There's not another time in our life Right. We'll do that again, and we're going to talk in a little bit about how you how you actually do that in your classroom. But I think before we go there, um, the the psychologist and and writer Steven Pinker says one of the problems in communication that we have as a society is an assumption about what a word means mm -hmm. um, that isn't necessarily shared from person to person. So right. maybe to start this conversation about leadership, you could define for us mm -hmm. how you think about leadership and and what leadership actually is because we've seen a lot of different i mean there's leaders in every industry we talk about influencers we talk about celebrities with with as leaders i'm curious about as a as a scholar yeah. um how you're talking about leadership that's a great question and i use the um book called leadership Theory and Practice by Peter Northhouse. And I love Peter Northhouse's definition of what leadership is. He says that leadership is a process whereby an individual influences a group of individuals to achieve a common goal. And I'm just going to keep it simple and keep it that way. Um, because the, the word process here in his definition can take many different turns, right? You could be a leader who you know, maybe you're a leader because of the skill you possess, or maybe the traits of leadership you possess, or you could say, you know what, I like different techniques of leadership, and I want to be a servant leadership, or a servant leader, or I want to be an authentic leader or a transformational leader. There are different processes that you can take in achieving um, your leadership um, role and in achieving an impact in the common good. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um when you're working with your students and you you mentioned that 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 one book that you're you know you're drawing from um how are you finding them um in terms of how they're thinking about leadership and how they're thinking about their lives are they coming into the classroom self-identifying as leaders or are they aspiring leaders like i like to be more assertive or um have more influence or or even um have more faith in my own my own opinions mm -hmm. i think you kind of hit the nail on the head um previously when you talked about how when you're 17 and you're applying for college um you know they kind of ask you like what do you aspire to do when you are older you know when you go to college what do you want to study um and then we just kind of end it there and we're you know, you're in there now, you know, you're on your own. Um, so um, I think um, what I do with my students and in, in, in my course, I want them to understand um, the basic questions that I believe humanity asks themselves. And I, I had an epiphany about this these questions during the pandemic, because I had some time to kind of think and ponder um, what makes us tick and, and how do we have what is a successful life what does that look like and and how do we have a fulfilling life mm -hmm. um so i ask them these four basic questions and and most of my talks are based on these four basic questions because i think we all kind of connect um in this way to these foundational questions and the first one is um what i ask my student is related to their identity and it's who am i so i ask them um think about when you are, maybe you're by yourself driving in your car and maybe the radio is not working. And so you are having to listen to your thoughts. How would you describe the idea of an answering this question, who am I? And usually some of my students are like, you know, I, I'm a four, I'm four of five girls. I, I like long walks on the beach. I, I love, you know, sushi, you know, I, I, you know, I just have fun. You know, I am who I am based on what I do and, and who I surround myself with. And I say, that's great, but that's not what I'm asking. I'm asking you, if I removed every single aspect of your life, how would you describe yourself? Um, and they have trouble doing that. 
And so I take time to kind of expand on that um, throughout the class. I tell and I teach them about the significance of their names and how their names and the meaning of their names can be one of the first place that you kind of start understanding who you are because your name is related to maybe your family background um, and it's related to um, maybe something empowering um, and you would be surprised what you learn um, from the meaning of your name and sometimes your name is not even related to you at all so now what do you do about that right um, and then the second question I, I ask my students is why are you here and they're thinking, you know, I'm here to get my college degree so I can go out in the real world and work um, and, you know, make some money, pay my bills. And so I say, that's great, but that's not what I'm asking. And <laughs> I'm asking you, why are you here on earth? What do you think your purpose is? Um, and what do you think you bring to the table? Um, because it's interesting that I've helped a lot of, or I've had meetings with a lot of college graduates and just book, just after they graduated, maybe a week or two. And I asked them um, these basic questions um, and I asked them to kind of relate their college degree to where they're heading and they can't really connect both. Um, so I'm hoping that I'm exposing my students to these different topics. So that way, when they do graduate, when they do get their degrees, they know where they're heading and they know what they bring to the table. Um, and the third question I ask my students is, um, what do you think is wrong with the world? And of course, they're they have so many responses to this. They think global warming is a problem. They think, um, you know, identity crisis is a problem. They think climate change is a problem. Um, and they're very, very um, passionate about what they think the problems are. Um, so then I ask them, what do you think the solutions are? And they usually are not sure. And it's they don't know how to connect the fact that they're getting a college degree to impact the common good. So I want them to be able to connect all of that. Um, and I hope I'm, I answered that question. Yes. Um, I took it into different directions, but I, I want my students to be well-rounded individuals. So when they get out there in the real world, um, they're able to make an impact. And what does that actually mean? And what does that look like? I want them to think about that before they show up. Mm -hmm. So just to reiterate, because I think people are probably thinking, I wish I'd written those questions down, um, mm -hmm. because they are questions we'd all benefit from thinking on. The first one is, who am I? Which mm -hmm. speaks to identity. Um, the second question is, why am I here? That speaks to purpose. Um, the third question is, what's wrong with the world? Mm -hmm. um, which is, is there a, does that map to some value or is it just, it's kind of an open ended what's wrong with the world today? That's a great question. So who am you answering the question of identity and purpose mm -hmm. and you finding out what's wrong with the world allows you to use your purpose and be authentic in who you are to tackling these problems. Because I, I think that the issue in the world is that we want to kind of point a finger and say, you know, global global warming is the problem or climate change is the problem, but we are neglecting the aspect of who we are and forgetting that we're connected to the problem as well. And mm -hmm. so if we're connected to the problem, then we're connected to the solution somehow. Um, mm -hmm. So how do we do that? Um, so it's, uh, that's the connection there. Yeah. And then of course the fourth is, so what are you going to do about it? Which, yes. kind of, yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. Yeah. Um, and you have found in your, in your anecdotal observation, I don't know if you've done a, a, a if you've written about this yet, but you've noted something very interesting about students um, and how they're viewing problems and what they're what they're kind of prioritizing, especially when it came to climate change. You said that, mm -hmm. and I correct me if I paraphrase this incorrectly at all, but you said the students are concerned about they'll talk about the environment and they will talk about the pressing need to um, to live more sustainably, but they kind of factor other people out of that equation, which I just that was an amazing insight that you had offered. So I was hoping you could speak a little bit more to that because I certainly haven't given the audience enough to know exactly what what you've what you've observed. Sure. Um, I think for me, the um, my first exposure to the way this generation thought about sustainability was um, started in the fall of 2020 mm -hmm. um, or in the fall of 2021, I'm sorry. Um, but in the summer of 2022, this summer, I hosted a youth um, program on campus for a month and a half. And from there, I worked with uh, high school students 
from the Providence County area, and I brought them um, on campus for a STEM exploration career um, event or month, um, and it was a great experience. And so from getting to know them, um, a lot of them, um, I think we had a lab um, activity where we took them to the biology lab in CBLS, and um, we looked at the reproductive um, system. Um, and so um, a lot of them shared with me that, you know, to be honest, I don't want to, I don't want to um, uh, participate in birthing the next generation. I, I, I refuse to um, become a parent. I don't want to do it. I think that becoming a parent is, um, is negatively impacting the climate. Um, and so um, I thought that was interesting. Um, <laughs> But then this fall semester, I was teaching my students and we were talking about um, what they think is wrong with the world. And they brought up the topic of climate change. And um, a few of them mentioned that, you know, I guess I asked them, why is climate change and sustainability important to you? Um, and a lot of them said that they just cared about the environment. Um, and so the topic of the next generation came up and a lot of them felt that, um, populating the earth is one of the problems in, in, in uh, preventing sustainability. Um, so I find it interesting that they don't want to populate the next generation, but yet they want to protect the environment. They want to, um, you know, produce or um, they want to kind of cultivate sustainability. And so I don't think they're able to connect the reasons why they're doing what they're doing. Why do we care about the earth? Why do we care about, um, why is climate change a big deal? Why is um, our health a big deal? Um, if it's not to impact the next generation somehow. So I, I would love to analyze why there's a disconnect there um, with my future students, or maybe if I research it later on in the future, but I find that very fascinating that they seem to not connect sustainability with the reasons why this is important. Um, so that that is a very interesting finding that I'm kind of gathering from a lot of students in this generation. They don't want to populate the earth at all. They think that's a problem, but they care about saving the planet. Yeah, it's very it's very interesting, and 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 I think that. Um you know, it ha as it happens in life, um, you, you know, as you age, it, it becomes harder and harder to find those instances where you are in a position to talk mm -hmm. deeply with, with a, a, you know, a generation or two generations younger than you are. So, so those, you know, if, if what you're seeing, you know, in your youth leadership course and in your courses at URI is, is, um, is, reflective of a general change um, in terms of everything, right? Uh, family units, how we view the earth, how we view humanity. Um, that's, I think that's a, a, a something that um, on which you could devote the, the entirety of your career to and, 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 and then some. Um, you had mentioned, um, you know, when I asked you for a definition of leadership, mm -hmm. um, to paraphrase what you said, you said in its in its at its core, it's about a person who influences to achieve a common goal, so a, a group goal. Mm -hmm. um, you have talked to me about two types of leadership that you I, I don't know if you'd say you prefer them above others, but but I thought they were both very interesting. And that is authentic leadership and transformational leadership, as opposed to you know punitive leadership or some that you know don't the, the type of leader you want to get away from rather than rather than work with. So could you right. talk a little bit about authentic leadership and transformational leadership and the the kind of the value proposition of each? Sure. Um, so authentic leadership is basically saying that you are a leader leading from a genuine perspective or a trustworthy perspective. So this kind of leader, um, whatever it is that they say, you can you can take that and, and take it to the bank basically because there's there's proof in what they're saying. There's, there's credibility there. Um, not only are they relatable, 
they're also very credible. Um, and so I think that as society, we're desperate for somebody who can just be genuine with us. I just want the truth. Tell me what the truth is. Is the sky really green or is it blue? You know, um, And not feeling um, the fear of, I don't know if that person is trustworthy or not. So leading from a, a, an authentic leadership lens, you're leading with a, a sense of genuineness and trustworthiness. And, you know, Peter Northhouse in his leadership book talks about how do we produce authentic leadership or how do we pr produce authentic leaders? And he talks about some positive psychological capacities. It's so long. I'm not going to talk about that, but I'm going to focus on the two things that he mentions um, really impacts our ability to develop authentic leadership skills. And the first one is moral reasoning. And the second one is critical life event. And I'll explain what that means. So moral reasoning is your capacity to make ethical decisions by about issues, right or wrong, or good or bad. Um, and so how do you make decisions? Because there are a lot of problems or issues or global crisis that come up that sometimes they're not very easy to um, solve, right? But how can you be discerning enough how can you develop wisdom? Wisdom is a word that um, I've been teaching my students because um, some of them um, don't know the difference between intelligence and wisdom. And I think there is a difference there, um, but using wisdom to make decisions on what is right and wrong and what is right and wrong. How do we discern that in, in a nation where technology is very, uh, it's a very, very powerful tool where if I'm looking for information, I can go and find it. Um, and I seem to be an expert. How do I know that somebody is an actual expert and not, they didn't just Google something and now they're telling me that, right? And so moral reasoning, being able to make ethical decisions. And the second one is major um, critical life events, and we, which are major events that shape uh, people's lives, right? Um, we will all go through different major events that shape our lives and kind of pivot us into different direction. And it's the way you handle it, it can be very powerful or can be destructive, right? Um, and I'll give an example of myself. One critical life event of what happened to me when I was younger was my parents won the visa lottery and they got to move to America. That's a very, very big thing. And my parents would always tell my sisters and I, I had, four, I, I have four younger sisters. So there's five girls and my dad. And, and so you can imagine how dramatic that can be. <laughs> and, um, we're always in the bathroom, but my parents told us that America is a land of opportunity. And so that's how I saw America. So when I, I, I arrived here, I thought, look at all these opportunities. I'm going to just knock on every door and see what door opens up. Um, and that's basically how I, that was, that's my motto uh, through life. Um, so these critical life events and how they happen um, allows me to develop resilience, allows me to want to live by example, allows me to want to be an authentic leader. Um, and so that's how we become authentic leaders is do we have a story and is our story even relatable is our story true you know because I think that uh, you would be surprised um, how impactful your story can be if you can just be genuine right um, and then transformational leadership to keep it simple transformational leadership includes assessing followers motives um, satisfying their needs and treating them as full human beings and I actually use a whole lecture explaining this idea of transformational leadership to my students, but because of our limited time today, I'm just going to keep it very simple and say, and a, a transformational leader goes into an environment and impacts the people in such a way that they want to live to their fullest potential. And what does that mean? I think it's different for each person, but being around a transformational leader it's a very, very powerful thing. Um, so I'll, I'll keep it there. Um, but, you know, to be honest, I can't decide on which one my favorite one is. I like them both. I think that you can't truly be a transformational leader without being authentic. So I think they're connected somehow. Well, that's, fa I didn't know about the visa lottery. So how does that, I'm just curious, how does that, how does that work? Yes. Yeah, so we were one out of 10,000 families 
um, that won that. So it's it's a, a long process where you have to kind of take passport pictures and um, and then you kind of put your whole family in and um, the American embassy decides if they want you in America. Um, and you either could get like a six month stay or you can get a year stay or you can just get to move forever. And that's basically what happened uh, with my my parents and I and my sisters. Um, we got the, um, we submitted our application um, and we were chosen one out of, I think 10,000 families or it could be more. Um, and um, our families put some money together and, and we all moved here um, all at once and kind of started middle school here. And um, it was a very, very, I, I think it was a very powerful situation um, and how it happened because my mom had been applying for 10 years before she actually won. Um, so, yes. Yes. So I, I, I'm going to skip around a bit on the questions that I was going to ask you because you told me a fascinating story about um, your mother's, um, I won't call it college advice, mm -hmm. I'm, but your, your mother's college talk to you. So could yeah. you? tell the the audience about that sure i i mean sometimes i laugh when i say this because it's it's just uh funny but um uh you know my parents or we moved here from nigeria when i was 12 and i remember i told you my you know my parents kind of sat us down and told us we're going to america it's a land of opportunity and of course my sisters and i were like very excited you know wow you know um and so uh when we arrived they gave us different options, you know, and when we were applying for college, they gave us even more options um, where they said, you know, and it, this is a joke and it's not, I mean, they say it, but it's not completely serious, but it kind of is, you know, they want you to make good decisions. Um, and so they would say, you know, um, we want you all to be successful in life. And so to be successful, we want you to pick five different majors and one last option that you don't want to choose. And so the first one would be, you know, you know, you could be a doctor, you could be a nurse, you can be a surgeon, you can be a, an accountant, you can be um, a lawyer, um, you could be um, something in the medical field um, or in the financial field. Um, and the last option is a shame to the family. And of course, my sisters and I are thinking, oh, no, no, we don't want to be a shame to the family. We'll either be any of these five options or nothing else, right? Um, so I, I think uh, my, during my college um, uh, uh, choice experience, my mom would come home every week saying, how about this major? How about this major? Uh, until I decided, okay, I think I'm going to do pharmacy. Okay. Is that, is that great? You know? Um, so it, it worked out in that way, but I, I always find it very funny um, to say that, yeah, they do give you an option and, and then they give you the additional option that you don't want to, <laughs> you don't want to choose and kind of uh, scare you a little bit to make good decisions. So, yeah, it's, it's a great story. So could you talk a little bit about um, your, your academic career at URI, because you were also helping your mother in a very interesting way as you were pursuing your own studies at URI. Right. Um, so being the firstborn of five girls, I have responsibility. I mean, I still do. I have responsibility to lead by example. Mm -hmm. um, so all the leadership uh, talks that I'm having now, I actually had to live them out. Um, so um, thinking of uh, my different responsibilities that came up as I was still a college student, like, you know, assisting my mom or assisting my sisters and, you know, kind of helping them out, you know, uh, going to some of their soccer games and picking them up um, and also balancing college at the same time. Um, so I, I learned a very great um, skill during that time when I was kind of struggling a little bit in my courses. Um, and I, I learned great time management skill. I was very thankful for the, um, the, the student development center where I would go and they would kind of walk me through my daily schedule and say, what do you do at this time? When do you have class? And um, kind of helping me develop these different skills that I was lacking at that time. And, and being a first generation college student um, was, was a very, very interesting time um, mm -hmm. because I kind of had to um, sort of figure out what worked for me? How do I learn and actually retain knowledge? And how do I display this knowledge when I take my different exams? Um, and, and how do I prepare 
all of that. So I, you know, realized that I have a responsibility as the firstborn. Um, and however, I don't have to allow these responsibilities to hinder my future success and my my thoughts, my thinking process and and how I make decisions. And um, and that's kind of how I um kind of, you know, mm -hmm. push through um <laughs> to that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you were helping your mother get her own degree, right? At the same time. Yes. Um, you know, that was a conversation I had to have with her that, you know, I, I think that based on how I'm learning and I'm, I'm developing my time management skills, um, I'm not sure if it would be a good idea if I continue this. And she understood, thankfully, um, and she was able to, you know, kind of, uh, you know, wear her strong pants as well as I'm, you know, also, <laughs> also in college um, on my own. And, and so, it took just a conversation to have with her because um, it was a learning process. Um, and yeah, I, I was very helpful to my mom and I'm always very helpful to my sisters as well um, because I my my whole goal is that I want all of us to attain success. I, I want to transform the the people around me. And, and my mom was one of that, even though she also transformed me as well. I also had a responsibility to also help her, um, but it takes balance. Mm -hmm. And you were doing all of it, if I if I recall our conversation. I mean, it every application and financial aid, like it all, it it all. I'm sure your parents helped, but yeah. fell to you to navigate mm. the entire, you know, higher education application yeah. process. And yeah, right. yeah, I yeah, I think the the way I was raised might be quite different than the way other people might be raised, or maybe it just has something to do with the fact of where we came from, right? Um, as the firstborn, you are placed, you have a responsibility. There's, there are no questions asked. Um, but some of, sometimes these responsibilities that are given to you um, might be a little too heavy to carry, um, but it's up to you to decide on how you want to navigate that and navigating it with respect. The Nigerians are very big on respect. And so it's, all right, so you're putting, you know, I have all this load. Um, and so how do I respectfully say, no, thank you, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, or, you know, uh, how about I help you in this way? Or how about this way instead? But I, unfortunately, I won't be able to do that. Um, so that took, um, that took learning on my part to learn how to say no respectfully. Mm -hmm. uh, and how to really truly assess what I can actually accomplish. Um, I still even struggle with that in my role now where I just say yes to everything, mm -hmm. where people are like, how about this opportunity? And I say, yes, sign me up, you know? And how about this opportunity? And I'm, yes, sign me up. And then I've learned that, you know, you can quickly get very burnt out by saying yes to everything. Mm -hmm. um, and how do you say no kindly and respectfully um, uh, has been a very great tool um, and a great skill for me to learn during difficult times. And I think I learned that from what, how I kind of um, helped my parents and helped my sisters out. Mm -hmm. Yes. I, I think that's um, probably one, one of life's greatest lessons is, yeah. is how to, is how to say no um, when um, the, the impulse is, is to say yes. And you, and it's, it's entangled with other things like a nice person would say yes, or a giving person would say yes. Exactly. So one of the topics that we always talk about in, in these webinars is actually giving, um, philanthropic giving, um, and um, that as a, as, a, as a life's practice, as opposed to maybe a one-time thing, it's not just about um, it can be, and uh, it can be about um, making, you know, financial um, uh, contributions to organizations that you care about. Mm -hmm. But in our conversation, and we talked about that in our conversation, we also talked about, um, you know, what it is to to give of oneself. Mm -hmm. And and I was curious about if you talk a little bit about your philosophy in how you make those decisions about where you're going to um, you know, do the work, the mm -hmm. philanthropic work, the, you know, the volunteer work that you do do? Right. Uh, that's a great question. I think when people think of volunteering or they think of community engagement, their first thought was, you know, or is, I, I'll go out in the community and I'll tell them how I want to help them. 
Wow. And people are thinking, wow, that's great. We don't need that help. We need something else, you know, um, <laughs> you know, so, so I think um, I've realized that it's very important to go out in that community that you want to impact and see what they need and try to help there, tailor it to what that community might need. We don't show up to different places and say, hey, I have clean water for you. I'm going to give you all the clean water supply you need. And they're thinking, we have clean water. We don't need that, but we would like some food, right? So sometimes I think some resources are misplaced because um, we're not really going out in the community to find out what is truly needed. Um, and I think my idea of realizing why I want to impact this generation is because I worked with this generation. I've worked with my generation. I've worked with the generation to come that are kind of rising up right now. And I've seen, and I've worked with um, the generation that is already, you know, kind of like, they're not this generation now. They've they've kind of had their own, you know, share of working in the professional field. And now they're maybe in retirement or maybe they're um, just on their way out of the professional world. And I've seen what everyone is saying I've kind of put it all together and and from there I realized that I really want to impact this generation and the one to come and I feel like I'm one of the voice voices of hope um, uh, in this generation and and um, but it came from really spending time in different communities different um, different um, generation and I guess one of the places I, I started having my epiphanic moment was being a floater pharmacist after I after I completed my my position at the Providence VA. I um I was a floater and I floated from different parts of Rhode Island. Um, I went and I worked in wealthy environments in Rhode Island. I worked in impoverished environments in Rhode Island. And I got to analyze that the problems and the issues that both communities were facing were very similar. Um, a lot of them were like generational um, ideas that just kept pa getting passed down from generation to generation that, you know, your grandparents have always thought this way. So this is what we'll do. Your, your, your great grandfather was this. So you must be that. Um, or, you know, uh, generational mistakes that just gets passed on about finances, um, about just various topics. And so I realized that, okay, um, I think the problems are very similar. And I, I think I would like to target the foundation um, of these different issues. And I kind of, I explain this even more by telling people, when you see an apple tree um, and the apple tree starts to grow rotten apple fruit, we don't, I hope we don't say, ah, oh, it's the fruit's fault. You know, we say, what's wrong with the root? Um, and 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 and, I'm, and the best way I explain this is that some of the problems that I've understood and analyzed in different communities, it's a root problem. And so, how do we target the root and not just the fruit that we can see um, that's going on? Maybe climate change or um, you know climate crisis is a problem, and it's showing up as a fruit that we're not really we don't really like. Um, but we don't target the fruit and try to polish it or try to um, make a fake fruit and try to attach it to the tree, we look at the root and find out what's the nutritional deficit here and how can we fix that? And I feel like that's where I come in, where I can see that the problem is not in the fruit of what society is saying, this is the problem. I think the problem really is in the root of each tree or whatever that tree is. Um, and that's where my foundational question comes into play because I'm targeting the root of why people think the way they do and and how to produce better fruit. Um, and I think that I hope that answers the question because um, and that's where my 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 philanthropic um, ideas come from because I want my students to go into different communities, gain experience, ask questions, and then target the root of the different issues and different problems and try to come up with solutions in that way. I, I I think too that that type of a, a philosophy or, or an approach right. um, is a wonderful has a, a benefit um, that's just coming clear to me in this moment that there are you know if you you spend just an hour or two watching the news mm -hmm. you're bombarded with so many things that right. 
that are so um, I'm going to they're compelling and and they're and the, a lot of them are terrible and um, I know there's something I'm, I'm forgetting the term I think it's empathy exhaustion where there's so many things coming at us right. that we we it almost seems like if we were to feel the true horror of every piece of bad news that we had that we we, we we'd curl up we just curl up in a ball yeah exactly. Um, yeah, but your process, what you're talking about and looking at the root, that allows you to kind of, all right, prioritize the thing that matters most to you and then do a deep dive into the, the root causes. And so it allows you to kind of make a determination about what the thing or things are that you're going to apply yourself to because we can't do everything. Exactly. Yeah. And Mary Beth, imagine if we all did that. Imagine if every human being did that. Mm -hmm. I think the world would be an amazing place to live. Um, but unfortunately, not everyone gives themselves the time to kind of think about these problems. Um, actually, we even share these different news. We're like, have you heard what's happening here? Mm -hmm. Have you seen here? And we're just spreading the bad fruit. Um, and nobody is talking about the root of the different problems. And so, yeah, I totally yeah. agree. That actually, shameless plug here for the College of Pharmacy, one of the things that I really love about the College of Pharmacy from my limited view, different stories that I've done, is how it is really concerned with the whole student. Um, you know, they offer um, meditation, they offer yoga, they have classes where they're asking you really to, to, to grow, grow mm -hmm. empathy. Yeah. Um, they are asking, you know, uh, when you were talking before about, you, I think you called it a floater position. Mm -hmm. You are, as much as you are learning about the science yeah. of your profession, mm -hmm. you are learning about the psychology. Well, yeah. that is science, I'm sorry. But you are learning about, um, um, the, you know, the nature of your community and yeah. the, you um, um, the, the socioeconomic situation in which a pharmacy may be. And there's, there's this, again, this holistic, uh, it requires a person who's thinking about, um, about medicine and about yeah. people holistically, because right. you do have to know so much about patients mm -hmm. as a, as a pharmacist. And, and um, I, I, I've seen that, at work um, in the lectures and the courses. Mm -hmm. And as I said, the way the College of Pharmacy um, is, is um, educating its students. I was, I'm just curious if that was your experience because you, you were the student. I'm just looking at it from out, as an outsider. Yeah, uh, great question. I have a student right now in my Leadership in Global Crisis course who one day stopped after class to ask me, um, Talani, how did you you know, do pharmacy and also had time to think about connecting um, a whole patient and the way they think and the way they make decisions about their medication and, and just the whole patient in your understanding of pharmacy. How did you connect both? And I thought that's a very interesting question. And he's just a student and, and um, going into the pharmacy um, profession. And I kind of um, explain it with this quote by Thomas Edison, um, who said that the doctor of the future will no longer treat the human frame with drugs, but rather would cure and prevent disease with nutrition. Um, and I'm not eliminating medications. I think medications, I'm thankful for them. You know, when you have a headache, um, if you did maybe finding out the causes of the headache, maybe it's a lack of sleep or lack of eating, whatever it is, but I'm thankful for different medications that help um, heal that. Um, but I think that there's a connection between understanding the, the person as a whole, understanding what the person eats, how they view nutrition, um, and how they view their health as a whole to kind of target that. Um, and as a pharmacist, and a good pharmacist, actually, you have sometimes intimate access to people's lives, because you know, you know, depending on where you work, you and depending on how long you've worked there, you get to meet the grandparents. Um, you get to meet the father, the mother, the sisters, the whole family who maybe show up at your pharmacy at different 
different times, but you get intimate access into people's lives, um, not only concerning their medications, but you get to know them, how they think, um, how they process how they think. Um, and so I think there's a connection there um, holistically when you um, are um, in the healthcare fields because you're connected to all of their information and you um, kind of assess how they make decisions. Um, and, you know, when you talk about, you know, blood pressure issues, or maybe it's high cholesterol issues, or maybe it's mental, um, um, mental um, uh, treatments and things like that, you get to kind of assess um, how, how is this working out for you? And, and why did you miss one dose today? Or why did you miss a dose of your medication for a month? what happened and, and, you know, analyzing all of that, I think that comes with the territory of being a, a pharmacist. So um, I think people misconceive what a pharmacist does. You know, they see a pharmacist maybe working in CVS or Walgreens or different uh, chains, and they think that's all pharmacists do. But pharmacists are in different areas of life. They're either in medical writing, or maybe they are working with the government, or maybe they're working in drug companies, or maybe they're working in the hospital, um, or maybe they're just working in managed care facilities um, to kind of manage the holistic patients. So I really enjoy um, the profession of pharmacy, that we are everywhere. Mm -hmm. I love that. Um, and I, I, that's, that's what I've come to appreciate is the, is the multifaceted approach to the work that you do. Um, so I'm hoping we have time for one more question. Um, this has been the quickest hour, <laughs> but, um, you know, there's a lot of, there are students that will watch this. There are leaders in their professions who will watch this. There are people who are aspire, aspiring maybe to make a change and, and, and wanting to make a, a name for themselves in a, in a field um, uh, that is new to them. Um, and I'm wondering if you could answer, um, you know, how do we, from wherever we may be um, in our lives, how do we um, all become better leaders? That's a great question. I usually have this hypothesis where I share with my students and I share with um, um, when I, you know, give a talk or and I have conversation, I talk about how or this, this is my hypothesis, mm -hmm. uh, which is that identity crisis and a lack of purpose is a global pandemic eroding the foundation of society. And disrupting our abilities to become good leaders. Um, you don't necessarily have to be a leader because you've been appointed to be a leader in a company or in different areas. You're a leader of your life. You're a leader of, depending on who you are, maybe you are a parent, you're a leader there. Um, maybe you do get a promotion at work, you're a leader there. Um, but the, the, the identity crisis that I think not that many people give themselves time to really analyze and the lack of purpose and the lack of and and the lack of purpose underneath that comes with a lack of drive and a lack of um, just excitement about life or fulfillment on, about life. Um, I think it might be a global pandemic right now more than um, the pandemic that we just are still kind of going through. Um, that's eroding the foundation of society. And I believe that if we can target these things and have conversations about these different topics and ask ourselves the hard questions, um, I think we're able to start building our foundation again as a society. And, and I hope that some of the questions that I'm asking this generation and that I'm even asking um, older generation that and the next generation to come that they're actually thinking about these things and, um, and uh, because I think it really impacts um, our societal foundation. And if we want a healthy society, then I think we need to kind of look um, within and have conversations about about these different things. I love that answer, and I I'm I'm madly trying to look this woman up right now. But one of the things that um, made me very happy um, recently was that uh, the winner of the Nobel Prize for Literature um, is Annie Erno, eighty two years old. So. One can lead, um, one can do, um, I think at any point in their lives. So I love, you know, how you, 
you started out in one area, you recognize that, you know, you could really have an impact with, with, with young people, but you also recognize, or are also telling us, I guess, that um, the opportunities, the opportunity to lead, the opportunity to be a leader is something that is available to all of us, no okay. matter where we sit. Regardless of our age, regardless of where, even if we've retired, I think there is a purpose that we still have to impact the next generation. We, I think our generation would love if we can learn um, from the previous generation who has gone through the professional world um, and what they've learned and what they felt worked and what they felt didn't work. So that way we don't replicate the same problem again. Um, you know, I would love it when somebody can somebody can remind me do you remember the struggle that humanity had in in 1910 and and what we learned from that I want to say yes I I, I don't know I want to learn that and and how can we prevent this in the future um and I hope that um everyone knows that regardless of your age your background whatever it is you're still you could still be a leader um there's still something that we can learn from you no matter what stage of life you're in Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, this has been great, Talani. Your messages of, of optimism and opportunity and, and impact have been um, fantastic. And I thank you for sharing them. And we're so happy and so uh, proud to have you as part of the URI community. Mm -hmm. To those of you who joined us today, thank you for, for joining us and taking time out of your schedule. Uh, this is the second event of our series for this academic year. Our next event will be in late January, so, so keep, keep your eye on emails uh, highlighting our speaker for that, that event at the end of January. Thank you so much for joining us. We hope you enjoyed your time here. Talani, thank you so much for sharing your, your experience with us. and. Um, and all, all of your good stories. And Mary Beth, you as well, thank you for hosting once again. We appreciate all you do to help us. Have a good day, everyone. Thank you. Thank Bye. You. Bye.